This video will briefly describe how to provide motor sparing surgical anesthesia of the hand, where our surgical colleagues want to have an awake patient who can move their fingers to command for intraoperative testing of movement. This slide lists the eight major terminal nerves of the upper limb and their branches. I've described the anatomy in more detail in another video. For surgery of the hand, however, there are only four key terminal nerves that we need to block. The four key nerves are the radial, median, ulnar, and lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerves. The lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerve is the terminal branch of the musculocutaneous nerve and a purely cutaneous nerve that, according to textbooks, supplies the skin of the lateral forearm and wrist. However, in reality, its branches often spill over into the hand, in particular innervating the region around the base of the thumb. So it's an important nerve to block for surgery of the hand. The radial, median, and ulnar nerves are the three other key nerves to block. However, if we want a motor sparing block, we need to be selective and block only the branches that innervate the tissues of the hand. Making sure that we avoid blocking branches that supply the flexor and extensor muscles of the forearm. We do this by targeting the nerves close to the wrist in the distal third of the forearm. The recommended blocks are therefore as follows. A median nerve block distal to the belly of the flexor muscles of the forearm, an ulnar nerve block similarly distal to the belly of the flexor forearm muscles but proximal to the takeoff of the cutaneous branches, and a superficial radial nerve block together with the lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerve which can be blocked at the same location as the superficial radial nerve as we will see. The lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerve can also be blocked at the elbow where it lies next to the cephalic vein which is the ultrasound landmark for locating it. I should mention that there are two other cutaneous nerves of the forearm, the medial antibrachial cutaneous nerve, which can be found lying next to the basilic vein, and the posterior antibrachial cutaneous nerve, which comes off the radial nerve just above the elbow. Blocking these two nerves and the lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerve at the elbow rather than in the forearm may help the non-sedated patient tolerate prolonged application of a forearm tourniquet. I will say though that I do not usually find it necessary in my practice to date. I'll now briefly describe my recommended techniques for blocking the four principal nerves. I usually start with the median nerve. The patient's forearm is supinated and the probe is placed in a transverse orientation on the ventral aspect of the forearm to locate the nerve. It lies sandwiched between flexor digitorum superficialis and profundus. Now it can sometimes be anisotropic, which means the nerve can blend visually into the muscles. So if you don't see it, tilt the probe one way, then another, and the nerve will light up. Now, for a motor sparing block of the hand, we do not want to block it up here in the forearm. Instead, trace the median nerve into the distal forearm towards the wrist, where the muscles thin out into their tendons. We will now be distal to and beyond where the median nerve and its anterior interosseous branch are innervating the muscle bellies of flexor digitorum muscles. To reiterate, we do not want to block the median nerve in the mid forearm, which is the generic forearm block approach that you may see described elsewhere. Instead, we want to block it close to the wrist. And the nerve itself may be blocked using an in-plane or out-of-plane approach but always advancing the needle tip at a trajectory that is tangential to the nerve surface to avoid piercing and damaging it. The in-plane approach is probably easiest for most people using a 22 gauge blunt tipped block needle. More experienced practitioners can use a 25 gauge hypodermic needle, either mounted on an extension tubing with an assistant to inject or using a single operator technique with a 25 gauge hypodermic needle, which is what you see demonstrated here. Now, I personally like the control over injection that it gives me, but it's not for everyone. In all cases though, we're aiming to enter and inject into the fascial sheath that surrounds the nerve, ideally with minimal to no contact with the nerve itself. Five to eight mils of local anesthetic within the sheath is sufficient. I do not recommend more than that as otherwise, there is a risk of proximal spread along the nerve sheath to the muscular branches that innervate the flexor muscles. With the arm in the same supinated position, we can identify the ulnar nerve. 
This is most easily done by placing the probe close to the wrist crease over the ulnar artery. The ulnar nerve is always located immediately adjacent and medial to the artery. Both nerve and artery can be traced proximally to the upper forearm where they begin to separate. For a motor sparing hand block though, we do not want to target it in this proximal location. Instead, we want to block the nerve close to the wrist, just as long as this location is proximal to the takeoff of the dorsal cutaneous branch and the palmar cutaneous branch. The dorsal cutaneous branch runs under flexi carpi ulnaris tendon and winds around the bony ulna to innervate the dorsum of the medial hand and the fourth and fifth digits. It can sometimes be seen separating from the ulnar nerve on ultrasound close to the proximal wrist crease. Because the palmar and dorsal cutaneous branches usually arise close to the proximal wrist crease, it's advisable to keep the probe proximal to that surface landmark. As I've already said, for the specific purpose of motor sparing blocks, we want to avoid blocking the ulnar nerve higher in the mid forearm, which as I said is the generic forearm block approach that you may see described elsewhere. Here we must choose a more distal injection site to avoid paralysis of flexor carpi ulnaris and digitorum profundus. And once again, you can use an in-plane or out-of-plane approach depending on your preferences and ergonomics. As always, aim to enter the fascial sheath surrounding the nerve at a tangent to the nerve itself. At this more distal location, the ulnar nerve is lying adjacent to the artery. Once again, more experienced practitioners can use a two-operator or a single-operator technique with a 25-gauge hypodermic needle. A 22-gauge block needle can also be used if you prefer. The same principles I described for the median nerve apply here, particularly the point about limiting the injected volume. Don't let the fear of block failure lead you to use excessive volume. As long as you see local anesthetic spreading within the fascial envelope and outlining the nerve, success will follow. Finally, we come to the lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerve and the superficial radial nerve, which innervate the dorsal aspect of the wrist and hand. The anatomical relationship of both nerves is very close at the wrist. My understanding of the optimal approach, particularly to the superficial radial nerve, has evolved, which you might notice if you watch my older videos. What I'm about to describe to you is my current simple and easy way to block these two nerves. The two key landmarks are the radial artery and the brachioradialis muscle. Both the superficial radial nerve and the lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerve have a very consistent relationship to the brachioradialis muscle. Note how the radial nerve branches just below the elbow into the superficial radial nerve and a deep muscular branch that innervates the forearm extensor muscles. The superficial radial nerve descends in the forearm, traveling under and deep to brachioradialis before becoming subcutaneous at the wrist. The lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerve parallels this course but travels superficial or on top of brachioradialis as we will see. From the supinated position, rotate the forearm into mid-pronation so that you can place the probe in the transverse orientation over the brachioradialis muscle. Note that this will actually be up in the proximal half of the forearm. Look for the radial artery which lies deep to brachioradialis. The superficial radial nerve is located in the same plane as the artery, deep to or under the brachioradialis muscle. Slide the probe distally, and you will see the brachioradialis muscle shrinking into its tendons and the superficial radial nerve becoming more and more superficial, running just lateral to the radial artery, until it's just under the investing fascia. Some of you may have also noticed that the lateral antibrachiocutaneous nerve is running on top of the brachioradialis muscle and at this distal level is in the subcutaneous tissues, but in a distinct and separate plane just above the superficial radial nerve. You could also start scanning closer to the wrist and use the radial artery as the primary landmark for locating the superficial radial nerve. I still though like to trace high up the forearm and down again to see the belly of brachioradialis expand and contract as this consistently highlights the location of both the superficial radial nerve and the lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerve. Because these are shallow subcutaneous injections, 
I personally prefer a 25 gauge sharp hypodermic needle to the blunter block needle, as the sharp needle penetrates skin and fascia with less effort and less tenting of tissues, and thus allows me to better control needle advancement. As before, if you prefer, you can also mount that 25 gauge needle on an IV tubing extension with an assistant to help you inject. But in all cases, use a local anesthetic jet to open up the fascial plane. You should not need to touch the nerve with the needle. You can withdraw the needle then into the shallower plane to inject local anesthetic around the lateral antibrachiocutaneous nerve after having finished injection of the superficial radial nerve. This post-injection scan shows the nerves now clearly outlined by the surrounding local anesthetic. Note that because these are both purely cutaneous nerves, you can block them higher up than the median and ulnar nerves in the mid forearm where the brachioradialis muscle is more prominent. In particular, if you choose to use a 22 gauge blunt tip block needle, you'll likely find this more proximal approach to be easier and more forgiving in terms of getting the needle safely into the correct planes. Again though, aim to pierce the fascia away from the nerve to avoid needle nerve trauma and let the local anesthetic jet find its own way to the nerve. 